And hello again, and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where truth is our mission, reality our realm, set as we see it, and frankly as well. I'm Joe Spina, along with the Honorable Paul Crowley. How are you, Paul? I'm great, Joe. How about yourself? You're looking pretty dapper today. Hey, can we get another close-up of Joe's socks? Joe's got the... What is it? You got a sock fetish or something? You've got me? the sock fetish. Those I don't like... know how that about that. Those, those, those are some pretty interesting socks. Anyway, um, we're going to get rolling. Right lots of to... stuff to talk about today, huh? Oh, yeah, but oh. Article 5, we're going to be talking about that later in the show. Well, you want that yep. every week. We yep. have that going. Yep. But I have to start with a subject that we broached with, uh, with uh, Lisa Wallace. And so we'll give you a little update, folks. Frankly, Joe... Somewhere in China, a chemist is producing fentanyl. Somewhere in America, an opioid user will OD on fentanyl made in China. Beijing is churning out new versions of fentanyl that are cheaper, more powerful, and often deadlier. Much faster than the U.S. can identify, classify, and ban them, Paul. It's unbelievable. Wow. For context, in Maryland in 2014, there were 186 fentanyl deaths. Last year, there were 1,100. Just in Maryland. Uh, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Across America, and including Lynn, fentanyl has taken over the drug market to ill effect. A mere three milligrams is enough to cause an overdose, which explains the mock spike in opioid ODs. Right. A hit of fentanyl, on average, is about 10 bucks street value. Same as heroin. But here's the kicker. A wholesale price for heroin per kilo is about fifty grand, fifty to sixty thousand, as opposed to fentanyl that wholesales, which is a synthetic that wholesales out at twenty five hundred per kilo. So you do the math. Right. Most of China's opioids enter the U.S. from the southwest border, mean like, Me mean meaning like the Mexico, of Mexico, exactly. Oh, so maybe we should build a wall there. Well, wait a second. China built a great wall. Maybe we should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. It is also considered, by the way, this new drug epidemic, or uh, fentanyl, as the weapon of mass destruction. Take a look, Paul. Huh? And this is what's happening to our youth in our country. Nobody's really talking about it. And we'll get into, has that subject come up in well, the debates? Know, well, no. You know, I, I don't know. If, I haven't heard it come up in the debates. But I, but I will tell you that it's not as if this topic hasn't come up. I mean, you hear Donald Trump talk about it. You hear Charlie Baker talk about it. We're talking about it, certainly. Um, but... You know, what, what alarms me, and this is the business with yeah. the wall, is that while there is certainly efforts to reduce the supply yeah. or, or the access to um, prescription pharmaceutical, you know, um, opioids, um, there really isn't enough effort going on to limit the b black market stuff. The entry, well, like a fentanyl from the southern border, like you said, also, as the 60 Minutes show from uh, Sunday night points out, there's a, a, an awful lot of um, prescription pharmaceutical drugs that are, that are not being regulated and a lot, they're being allowed to enter into the black market in the United States. But they're coming from China, Paul. No, these are coming from the pharmaceutical companies directly. That's what they're claiming, but they're coming from China. That's where they're really coming from. China is making synthetic, and there's no regulation. In other words, no one knows what the dosage is. I tell you, they're both. it's a both. I wouldn't say that, no, it's not the pharmaceutical companies, it's China. I would say it's China doing their thing, and the pharmaceutical companies doing their thing. But here's the difference, Paul. What's coming in in the street, we're talking about street use, right? Right. The largest percentage, that which has taken over the market, is fentanyl, which is a synthetic. And it drove the price down. By driving the price down to the wholesaler, their retail price is the same as heroin. So they're not going to buy heroin. They're not going to deal in heroin. Heroin costs 50, 60 grand a pop. It's not a synthetic. So what's happening is, is that China is undercutting our own pharmaceutical companies in the illicit trade, okay? okay? And, now, let me stop. In Kentucky... Two counties in Kentucky that don't have that many people have the largest pharmacies that you'd ever want to see. You know why? Because they're all prescribing what exactly we are talking about. Right. We're permitting these things to happen. Right. And that's what they were saying the other night, that, hmm. that, that uh, there's, there are more pills entering in those two counties than there are people. In Kentucky. In Kentucky, right. Right. So, and, and here's the point that I'd like to make, and that is that if you follow the money, yeah. And this is whether, whether we're talking about 
the, um, the ruling class, the, um, the donor class, the media, Hollywood, the financial industry, the pharmaceutical industry, if you follow the money, you will find out your answers to pretty much every decision that's making, made in this country. And as it relates to pharmaceuticals, they actually managed to change the laws, according to this, this report by CBS on 60 Minutes, and I, while I don't know that it's all 100% accurate, it makes sense to me because it's a follow the money kind of thinking. There's so much money in selling opioids, pharmaceutical opioids, whether it's, uh, I don't know, Xanax or these things or, or um, um, you know, there's a, a whole host of them. At some point, they go for a hundred bucks a pop and stuff like that. And but here's, here's, bitch, here's this, this, but that's, no, no, the, that's no, the inaccuracy no, of but it, here, No, but here's the point. What? You start, what is it? It, it? So you can buy, you, if, if you're in the market for opioid or opioid-like right. substances, yeah, and you can afford to buy pharmaceutical, very regulated, perfectly dosed okay. things for fifty or hundred dollars a pop, and you can afford to do that. You would prefer that over buying the ten dollar bag of heroin or the five dollar bag Paul, of fentanyl. You can buy Mercedes Benzes, you can buy Lexuses, and all the rest of it. But the car that makes the money is the Ford Focus. It's the Hyundai. That's the market. That's the turnover. Right. But, but so it's the ten dollar bag that's causing the problem. The person that pays a hundred bucks for a pure pill knows what they're doing. They're right. lights, they're less apt to OD. But here's my point. And, and, what? and that is that while China may be selling fentanyl and is, you know, through Afghanistan, op the opi, you know, the whatever the poppy yeah. seed, whatever, they're all making their money. But just like you were saying, the Ford Focus is the one where all the money is being made? Sure, but they're still selling Lexus. That's and, true. And my point is that the pharmaceutical companies are making a lot of money by over-distributing the but, product. But they're not the primary problem for the ODs. It's got to do with, look, put up this. I don't disagree put, with that, though, Wait, wait, wait. Let, 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 me, let me go backtrack. Put up my graphic on the opium wars in China. Not that one, the other one. The den, I'm sorry, the opium den. Uh, take a look at this, Paul. The opium wars arose from China's attempt to suppress the opium trade, which is what we're trying to do. Foreign traders, primarily the British, had been illegally exporting opium, mainly from India to China since the 18th century. That's when our country first was, came into existence. But that trade grew dramatically from about 1820 forward, the resulting widespread addiction in China was causing serious social and economic disruption. The rulers of China went to war with the British and the European powers to stop the opium trade that was completely destroying their society, which is precisely what's happening tonight. This is the ironic part about it. Right. The Western world, in you know, made the Chinese into drug addicts, and they now are producing the drugs that's making the United States into a bunch of drug addicts. Right. There's, a, there's a perverse irony in it. This has been going on. And what do they call the Queen of England? She was a great drug dealer, right? Apparently, they made yeah. all their money with opium from India, from Pakistan. I mean, that was part of India at that time. Right. And Afghanistan, that's where the poppy fields are. And, if you, and here's the funny feature. Look at, look at it. Put up the opium one. Look what a beautiful plant it is. The natural hair, it's a beautiful looking plant. I mean, you want that in your backyard. And what do they have there? What do the Chinese have to do? That big yellow thing, folks, is China. They had to build a 2,000 mile wall to protect themselves. From the drug trade. From everything, uh, from invasions, right, right? right? And here we are arguing over whether we shut off the border to prevent it when we know it's coming in from the south. We absolutely know it. The pharmaceutical companies are, not, are complicit, don't get me wrong, but they're not the real issue. The real issue and the most important issue is to regulate, which we don't do, and we have no idea because they're, they're changing and altering 
the drugs, the chemists over in China all of the time. Well, so so here's my thinking, and, yeah. and this gets back to you know, you know, we talk occasionally. You joke about me that I lost some weight. I mean, and you, mm. people ask me all the time, "How did you lose the weight?" And it's not as simple as you know going on a diet. You know, you you have to think about what you're eating. You have to be mindful of the calories you're taking in. You need to exercise. You need to be active as much as possible. There's a lot of things that you can and should be doing, not just any one thing in particular. And it's the same thing when you're addressing a, a scourge like uh, the, the the drug epidemic in this country. So you're saying we should hit it on multiple fronts? Absolutely. So, okay. so, so you need to push back against the pharmaceutical companies, not only so that they'll stop distributing through the black market, but also the, so that they so that there will be a reduction in the access to pain medication for those who really don't need it. Well, first of all, as one as one piece of the solution. Yes. But you, look, pharmaceutical companies are regulated. Not enough, apparently. But they're regulated as, as far as doses and purity of the product they're yep. making, okay? Yep. They're regulated. Dangerous, but regulated. Yep. They're not supposed to get on the black market, their drugs. They're right. not intended for the black market. Right. But that the stuff coming from China is, right. and it's unregulated, and they can mix it with any compound they want, which is what's making it deadly, right. and its potency outstrips that of all the other drugs. That's the point I'm trying to make. That's all. And, and so the first thing to do, we cannot all. handle our trade with China. You know, and we are enriching China by opium trade, by, we sell China, Paul, all of our garbage. Do you know that's the number one export in the United right, States? Right, right. To China. China recycles it and sends it back to us as product. The insanity is on and on and on. Our, our elected officials and the folks that we have in government, there is a swamp. Yep. And the guy that's trying to clean it is getting tattooed and getting hammered by people who want the swamp to continue it, the well, denizens. And, and, and I would agree with you 100 percent. I'm not going to deny that, that what you're talking about is a real and a major focus of what needs to be done. All I'm saying is the pharmaceutical companies are part of the swamp. Of course they are, and but they're not a major part and they can be controlled. The reason why they're not a part and why they get away with what they get away with is because you have politicians who pass legislation and lobbyists that favors them that allows them to right. do it in the first place. And, and let's just talk about that quickly. So well, we can. So two Republican, a Republican, two Republican congressmen sponsored a bill yeah. dere essentially dere uh, uh, defanging the DEA and their ability to push back against and um, who signed it, Paul? Well, no, let me finish. So, so it was. So they sponsored it. Was two Republicans. Yeah. In 2015, it went to a. Um, was it, so it would would have been a Republican-controlled Senate, and through a voice vote. Wait, what year? 2015. That was not a Republican-controlled Senate at that time, was it? Sure. Okay. 15 and 16. So. so on a voice vote. On a voice vote. Yeah. It was unanimous. So in other words, there's nobody had to. Take about uh, both parties. Yeah, so it was very quietly done, and then it went into the House. Republican, unanimous Republican, vote. just a uh, uh, unanimous vote. So, in other words, bipartisan, 100 percent bipartisan. But who signed it, Paul? Well, let me. I'm going there. Yeah. So that was that was to get it all done, and then unceremoniously. Do you ever remember when when there's a legislation that Obama wants to be proud of? He he gets all the people standing behind him, and he uses ten pens to sign his name and all that kind of stuff. None of that stuff. It was done in the under the cover of darkness, and it, and the reason and the is, point being, there's 538, uh, no 535, 435, 435, 535 congressional people. Yeah. That are that benefit from the, the pharmaceutical lobby who didn't want to oppose this thing and didn't want to be on record of having supported it, so they pretended that it didn't happen. And then you got Barack Obama who did the exact same thing. That's the swamp working overtime and I late into the that, night. But the Paul, the point of the matter is that's that's a given. <laughs> You but it's not a given. I don't think people re realize how insidious this stuff is. Of course they do. It, on the city council, stuff like this happens all the time. At the state level, the stuff happens Wait a minute. all well, the let's, time. Let's, let's, let's get to your yeah, Paul. We got, we got a lot to do, and we can't hang on this subject all, all right. night long. People can see 60 minutes to make the judgment that they want from right, that. So we're going to take care of it. So you, you, so you, you get me off this Well, this because, you, Paul, you, uh, we're going on to the subjects that you wanted me to outline for you and the fifth. No, we I can't get it. We can't get it done unless we move. I know. So get I'm to sorry, Frank I, get, I get a little bit wound up about the drug stuff. Yeah, so. that's fine. And the... Um, 
hypocrisy of government. It is hypocrisy. Okay, so my frankly poll this week, uh, is Lynn facing an $8.5 million deficit? Will a full forensic audit of the city's finances show us where the city stands and where the money is going? Senator McGee said yes and yes. Furthermore, the audit would provide full transparency. The mayor counted the city recently had a full audit. It revealed that no raises for city employees until 2022, and as many as 30 employees should be immediately terminated. She says that's not possible. Arbitration and minimum staffing levels in the fire department negate such actions. As for budgetary transparency, she noted, I was the first mayor to put it online. Both made assertions. Let's see how they stand up to scrutiny. Well, you tell me, you're a forensic accountant so, in a sense. Is there any truth to this? So I got I, I to do some background, give you some background information. My, my third term on the city council um, in, in my efforts to try to make some, put some changes in, I was reading through the charter, and in the charter it requires that the city audit, have, do a managerial audit of each of the departments in some type of rotation. So okay. in other words, you do the fire department one year, the next year you do the police, then you do the school department, then you do the you know um, DPW, and then the smaller departments and so forth. And you do them, and you just keep recycling. It's required by the charter. Good point, right? So, so let me ask you this then. If that's the case, then that is a fallacious argument that we need to have an audit, forensic audit, when it's required. Is that what you're telling me? It's required. I, so therefore, is it fallacious? I don't know. I, I well, can't wait really. The, 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 it says so, he said at the debate, McGee said that he wants a full forensic audit of the city's finances. You're telling me that's already done. No, I'm saying it's required. I'm not saying it's done. All right, so so it's, tell, it's a requirement. So, so it's a requirement of the charter. And when I discovered that back, you know, like four or five years ago, yeah, and it was in it was in the second year of my third term when I was running for re-election, I asked for an audit committee to be created. It was created. We set it up, and the first thing we did is we got an outside auditor to come in, and we talked about doing an audit of the books and so forth and trying to get this whole thing going. This drove the institutions within city government crazy because what was happening is I was going after their departments, and they were all worried about it. And what happened, and that, this is just my opinion, but what happened is I got run out of office, and it died on the vine. It never happened. So... My point is that there's already a, a capacity within the city charter to make sure that the departments are audited regularly, but the institutions of government prevent it at every turn. Did she call an audit? Um, she I believe claimed she, that I she believe, called a full I, audit. Did she? I believe she did. So she complied with what you were talking about in spirit, right? Yep. Uh, she, she did what you were talking about that's required that hasn't been practiced. So she did. So that's factual. Secondly... Will that audit, or did that audit show that you could, there wouldn't be any raises until 2022? Is that what the audit showed? The audit showed that you couldn't raise. You couldn't raise, um, you couldn't raise people's salaries That's right. with, the, with the current money flow and all, all right. that kind of stuff. And that, that as many as 30 employees had to be terminated immediately. Is that accurate? Right. You know, okay. Right. So everything she said there is accurate. And she said, by the way, None of that is possible. That's what the audit said, but it's not possible. She said the reason why this is impossible... Because of the institutions of government. Exactly. She said arbitration and minimum staffing of the fire department won't allow it to happen. Right. Right? So that's number one. And why do, we have, why do we have st uh, arbitration and minimum staffing patterns? It's because city officials, elected officials, cave into public sector um, pressures To the all unions, the actually, Paul. Always. To the yeah. unions. Okay. Yeah. But that's what uh, happens. So, everything she said seems to be accurate, right? She says, as for budgetary transparency, I was the first man to put online. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So, all we want to do is find out whether the assertions were correct or not. I mean, that's all yeah. we can do, right? right? All right. Now, another issue came up, and it was sanctuary cities. Now, this is something that we've talked about often on this show. And is it a big issue? Yes, no. We've asked that. Now, apparently, that came up in the debate. And the mayor said she's categorically opposed to making it a sanctuary city, correct? She she's on record, that. categorically opposed. But 
The Tom McGee was not. He, and he, he would not answer. And for some reason, he refuses to answer that. He, he, he has been asked that question, I've got to believe, a, a number of times. And by the way, we raised that question a few months back, then that's right. We, on, right on this very show, that that was a, an issue that um, needed to be addressed because it was, I think, your opinion and certainly my opinion that as a city, I think the electorate, or, or the, yeah, the electorate in the city of Lynn is more in support of sanctuary cities than they are opposed, in support of, are opposed to sanctuary cities than are in support of sanctuary cities. So in other words, if there was a, if there was a referendum in the city of Lynn on should we be a sanctuary city, it would go down. That's right. I think that, and, yeah, and so it's very interesting that if, if you if you are as a as an elected official are unwilling to address that particular point, you have to ask yourself why. If the the majority are supportive of it, why? And that would be because. It, plus, it's also linked to the uh, the uh, an attraction to bring in all the students that are swarming our system. We'll get to that in a second. Let's put up the. Uh, the little collage of these councils at large. There was a get together. Uh, they got together. I call it uh, the uh, the debate of eight. There's the the eight candidates and their little. But actually, the debate of eight took place here uh, in our studio. And the five principal this was things, night? Paul. Huh? This was last night, right? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, Monday night. Right. right. And, and it had five uh, principal points. The first thing was they talked about. Their proudest accomplishments, which I think is a pretty good thing, Paul. Don't you think? I mean, yeah. people get to know and who you are. Then they talked about public safety and diversity and seven million dollar budget deficit, as opposed to the eight point five that Tommy McGee was talking about. They all right. used a different figure, so it's already come down a million five since the mayoral debate yeah. evaporated. And dirty streets, isn't that a classic? Dirty streets, yeah. Yeah. So let's get to city finances. First of all, they all agreed that there's a need to find a way out. <laughs> all right? All right? So, yeah, if let's finances say, are bad, you need to find a way out. I'll come, that's, you know, that's... that's well, well, let's analyze what they did. So, we have Nett, Barton, and LaPierre, who, on the, on the city finance, they all pointed to the stopgap measures initiated to avoid payoffs. Layoffs. And here are the three. Adoption of a meal tax, that takes care of about two policemen, right? Yeah. Uh, the licensing of two marijuana clinics, and imposing a trash fee. Those were the stopgap measures. Uh, is that going to help the budget out of $8.5 million deficit or $7 million? Huh? I mean, that's a Band-Aid, is it not? Maybe a million bucks there. Uh, okay. All right, now let's maybe. go one step further. So now Tasso comes up because, wait a minute. All we need is a master plan. Well, we, we can hire a grant writer. That's that, helpful. That doesn't do anything for the revenue. Thank you. Then we have Tasso, Net, and LaPierre. We need, guess what? A planning department. Let's spend money, get a planning department, and a grant writer to bring in dollars from all sources. Another good thing, uh, I, on you know, in, in essence. Right. But, but it, uh, it. Well, John Ford it, says let's attract business, which is fine. But nobody, nobody talks about how to do this. And Ladd says a deficit is a detriment to attracting business, which is absolutely right. It is. So here we have a debate by councils at large who are the. But, I mean, they, in effect, set the program for taxes and things of this nature, correct? Yep. All right. Is there anything here that talks about revenue? See, they all skirt the one issue. You have raise to raise tax. taxes. Right. And then none of them want to talk about it. You have to raise taxes unless you slow the flow of kids going to our school system, which is costing us an additional $5 million per year. Right. And has for the last five years. Isn't that the real problem? It is, yeah. Yeah. Well, how come no one talks about how one, How come no one's talking about the exorbitant cost of education in the city of Lynn because our population and ratio to, you know, school Stu population and ratio to our total population is double that of oh, all yeah. the communities around us. Right. Um, I'll tell you why. Because as soon as you say anything like that, you're accused of being a white supremacist or a racist or opposed to diversity or... You know, all of those, you know, mean-spirited things that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. white people, white men especially. What does this get to do with color? I mean, I, I, I go but to that's, the, But don't yeah. you think that's the reason? I mean, what, no, it, I think the reason is is because we, a lot of folks in Greater Lynn, you know, Greater Lynn, a lot of folks in Greater Lynn 
have properties inland that are subsidized that they're making a ton of money on, one reason, right? Because we have a disproportionate amount of subsidized housing in the city lit. Would you agree to that? All right. All right. That compounds the problem. Okay, so, so it's two things. So I think you, you do have both. You have, you have a case where there's a lot of people who, you know, the social justice champions who are going to push push and say well, that, we're, that we're being, uh, you know, racist or being white supremacist. And you also have the, the follow the money crowd, people who financially benefit the, the, the more. A whole bunch. The more, the all the nonprofits benefit ph phenomenally. Right. The people but, who are working on nonprofits. But they're, they're most of the ones that are in the social justice kind of sphere. Now, so. you're, now you're leading to it. The social justice warriors, right, right are using Lynn as a social justice Petri dish right. in which they cultivate all of these different programs. I was at a meeting today, and um, you, you've, you know what the term gentrification means, right? That's yes. when you know you, you, more affluent people move out into the suburb, into the into the urban areas, right? And no, it's the other way around. It's when when people from the urban areas move in and push out the. You get what I mean? Yeah. Like my daughter. Who bought a brownstone in Boston when you know in right. Southern when it was nothing, right. and everybody moved in, right. pushed everybody else out. Right. That's so. That, uh, right. So the gentrification is that the more affluent people move into an area, forcing out those of lesser right. means because they drive up the right. prices. So that's gentrification. Now, in a in a in a community that's trying to revitalize itself, mm -hmm. you would think that gentrification would be viewed as a good thing, right? Yeah, but you've got guys who are camping out with tents saying it's bad. Right. And that's my point. What I heard this morning is they were screaming bloody murder that there was gentrification going on in Lynn. And the only way that we're ever going to get out of this malaise and develop a greater tax base and to go to John Ladd's point, deficit of deterrent and attracting business, the only way we're going to get there is if we have some kind of gentrification and some people coming into the community that can actually contribute financially, whether it's through spending money in the community or raising, creating jobs and things like that. If that's not happening, then we can't help anybody because we're not going to have any money to do it. Because so you're going to kill the golden goose. Right, and that's my point. So, so while, I, while I am mindful and concerned about people who are dislocated as a result of gentrification, we can't just say no to gentrification because... It's not fair to a It's bunch a of balancing people. act, Paul. It, absolutely. It's, it's a, it, you have to have X amount of uh, folks who are providing uh, the cash and the flow in order to take care of those who aren't. Right. You know, it's, it's a balancing act. It's way out of kilter in the city of Lynn. That's right. the problem. Right. That's you know, we, we do a wonderful job of educating people. Right. You Lynn, talk about our it, compassion, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we, Lynn is, is a welcoming city and everything else, but you just can't. Be over, you know, you can't be swamped with all of the social problems that Lynn's been whacked with for as long as I can remember. Look, I said 45 years ago, I said Lynn was a dumping ground, right? And they call me all kinds of names. Paul, I know that. You know, I'm kind of racist, this, that. But the reality is that we are. Right. And unless we change that, not much is going to happen, right. all right? And not good. And this is why the debate on finances when you don't talk about the influx of uh, the school system, you know, kids coming in from all over the place. They're wonderful kids, don't get me wrong. And if you don't talk about the disproportionate amount of subsidized housing in the city, and you don't talk about maybe they're going to have to raise taxes. I don't want them to raise taxes, Paul, but my real estate... By the way, they did raise taxes. They did it surreptitiously because my bill went up. They dropped the tax rate and increased the value of my property, correct? So, so it, instead of me paying 4800 I'm paying fifty two. Right. Like everybody else out there. So forget about that meal tax, which is nickels and dimes. They turned, not even that, it's fractions of a penny. They actually raised a property tax about four, five hundred bucks a year on the average homeowner, right? Yep. And on top of it, and you can tell, you know, your friend who's mad at me, Peter Capano, because they want to do another buck and uh, 150 million on a separation pro project. That's going to jack up, even though it's in the water. So that's going to jack up. That's, right. a, that's a fundamental tax, isn't it? Yeah, eventually right. we're going to have to then, pay for it. So if you question whether it's necessary or not, does that make you a bad guy? Are you saying bad things about people? No. Well, no, I agree. I mean, I, it certainly open, we should have a debate about it, and it would be talk about it right? at least. I yeah. mean, you know, is, how necessary is it? Will it work? Is it is it value added? You know, I mean, no, look, everybody's in favor of clean water, clean air, but there's a point at which it becomes ludicrous. I mean, if you're 98 percent pure 
and the other one percent, or the other two percent, is going to cost you sixty trillion dollars. You know, you got to pass on the sixty trillion. I'm sorry to say, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. You got to make that evaluation now. Cleanliness. All agreed that the way to do it is by educating the public on recycling. How about just something called community values? How about saying you have to paint your house, you have to cut your lawn? How about that type of stuff, Paul? Do we have any of that? No, and, and you know, you think about what they do, like in uh, communities like uh, Almatha's Vineyard and, and so forth, where, you know, they, they have, um, you know, ordinances that say there's only certain colors you can paint your house and that kind of stuff. That's a little, probably a little bit more than we would need to do in the city of Lynn. But I think you're right. I think it, it would, it would, well, let me just say, I, I really don't like the idea of saying, if you don't mow your lawn, I will give, write you a ticket. I would like to figure out some way to incentivize people to mow their lawn regularly and, and clean up. Just as an example, I've never done this, but someday I'm going to go. I'm going to go into the bank with a hundred dollar bill, and I'm going to ask for a hundred one dollar bills. And I'm going to stand out about twenty feet away from a trash can, and I'm going to pass out a dollar every time somebody puts trash in the trash barrel, just to draw some attention to the to the value of. You know, like if you if you but see, unra if you unwrap the, yeah, the, the okay. candy bar and, and, and you eat the candy but should bar, they be rewarded? how often do you see people go? And I they do, just drop but, it right but, there. but I have a problem with rewarding them. I, I have a problem that the way that you get someone to behave is like training a dog. You know what I mean? You give them a little treat. No, it should be it should be a matter of self pride, responsibility, and self pride. Paul, you look terrific. I mean, your hair's combed, you got a nice shirt and tie on, great suit, your nails are clean. Why? Because you have personal pride. Right. All right, I don't worry about you trashing up the city, but if you don't have any personal pride, I don't care how much you're going to give yeah, them. I get it. And look, I'm not going to change the world by passing out $101 bills. I know that. But, but it's, it's really more of a symbolic thing, a way to draw attention to the matter. And then maybe we can get a story in the newspaper that will talk about having that pride. Paul, well, we have one that says that you can't spit on the sidewalk, right? Right. That basically makes sense because it's unsanitary and a lot of other things. Can you urinate out in the street? Right. No. All right. So I don't see why we can't take it to the extreme that if people are doing stuff like that, you know, littering, that we whack them. You know, in fact, instead of giving them a buck, let's hit them for a 50 and a 100 to not do it, and they won't do it. Right. You get what I mean? That's all. Yeah. So cleanliness, look, everybody's for cleanliness, but that's, that's a personal, that's a cultural development. We've got people to stop smoking over time. Right. Get people to stop being slobs over time. Right. Uh, public safety. Now, all agreed on the need. Do you disagree with public safety? I mean, I love the armed forces, by the way. I want to spend more money hey, on it. Look, I, I mean, for every politician worth his salt, you say, what are the five most important things? And they will say public safety. They will say education. They will say a balanced budget. And they, they will say five things, mm -hmm. and, and 100% people are going to agree with it across the board. The question isn't what the issues are. The question is, what are you going to do about them? Like you were saying, how are you going to pay for it? Right. All right. Yeah. Now, if you got no money coming in, how are you going to pay for it? And this is the part that gets me. Uh, I love what Figueroa had to say, though. He said, and "You have to couple it because you can have all the cops you want in the world. It's not going to help unless you educate people. Do some. What you, you talk about this a lot, Paul? Preventive education. I buy that. Yeah. So that's good. That's a, that's part of the package. Yeah. But." We have to understand that all of this is meaningless unless we have control of the budget. Right. And I haven't heard anybody talk about how to do that. No. They haven't got the guts to say, worst comes to worst, they're going to have to raise taxes. And that's not going to sit well with folks in Wards 1 and 7 and 2. Hey, and let me tell you something. The budget starts in, budget start on July 1st, right? Yep. Elections happen in the first week of November, right? So, so forgetting about when the, when the election is, when would be the best time to set the tax rate? Would be during the budget process, right? Mm -hmm. But no, they do it like two weeks after the elections. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. That's, that's to protect that's, themselves from the election. Blame it on the last council, the last oh, sure. mayor. Yeah. But so, I mean, that's Finger really, pointing. Right. So that's what that it's all about. So, and... and 
I was on the council for six years, so we had to, we, so three times we had to do the, you know, to set the tax rate, and we, and the, 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 the what we always did was the lowest residential tax factor allowed by law. Mm -hmm. So that we're benefiting, so it looks like we're doing for the, res, the, 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 the people who live in this community, right? As opposed to, you know, giving a break to the commercial tax base. And that's, you know, everything, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors, it's all designed to make people believe that you're well, thinking if of people, them. if people out there start voicing themselves, they did on, they did on the two schools, they go shop on that real fast. Right. They start, start thinking of some of these other ones. Now I want to get to the last thing that you talked about, uh, under the it was diversity, and there's something to be said about that because we are a diverse city. And uh, Figueroa said that uh, city hall should should really mirror the diverse in the city. And to some degree, I agree with a lot of that, but not totally. You know, we have 26 languages, 30 languages spoken in the city. You can't do that, you no. know. So you no, have to right. kind of. But but you know, and if uh, Figueroa were to get it under the city council, that would that would um, put a, a, a you know, and, and assuming that Buzzy Barton and Hong Net were to, to remain on it, that would um, increase the number of uh, diverse non, non whites yeah. by th to three. Uh, that's I think true. That, I think that's uh, good. But, but the, the other, you know, the idea of having a diversity office, uh, that bothers me somewhat. You know, I, I have to think about that's, that a little uh, bit. That's, uh, that's uh, diversity police, right? That because, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, a little I, concerned I, I about, little that. Yeah, about that. I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, but, uh, I, but, I, but I do applaud, I mean, you know, and I saw, I was reading the story in the paper that, you know, they were saying, he, I think he may have said that, you know, having flag raising ceremonies isn't enough. And while I agree that that is virtually symbolic in terms of what it does you know it's just you know we'll do the Guatemalan flag and then next week we'll do the uh, the Cambodian flag you know and that kind of stuff I think that that is that's a nice gesture and it's symbolic in nature I will say that Judy to her credit has increased the uh, diversity of the city hall in her time when she had when he, she had the opportunity to put positions in. It wasn't somebody with the last name Kennedy or the last name Flanagan or, or friends. And she was basically putting in people that um, were qualified and of color. And you I know, it's interesting you mentioned about flags. I have a Sicilian and Italian flag on my house because of my heritage. No, you also have it on your Facebook. That's right. Yep. That's a And I also crazy have my American thing. flag. Yep. All right. And the rest of it. That's strictly, strictly a cultural thing and it should be on it and respectful. All right, we got to get to your stuff, Paul, because we're running out of time rapidly. So, the Federalist Papers, the purpose of government, if we flip that up there, the purpose of government of the United States Constitution or the United States Constitution is to limit the power of the federal government, not the American people. That's your favorite, right. Paul. And, and let me just say that um, I've, often, I've often marveled at how it is that as as a taxpayer and as, an, uh, as a voter in the city of Lynn, that it's kind of expected that we will pay homage and um, tribute to all of our elected officials, whether we donate to their causes or, or you know, almost bow to them, kiss the ring, that type of stuff, which suggests the other thing is true. What really should be happening is whenever an elected official comes in contact with a taxpayer and or a uh, voter, they should be the one that should be, um, you know, paying homage and tribute to the person that elected them and got them into office. The and it's, and it's backwards. The elected officials are servant, Paul. That's right. He's an employee. And, of and I'm the going to people. tell you something. I, I made I made a, a clear distinction when I in my third my third um, um, actually the last time I read, ran for public office, I was complaining that people were referring to themselves as public servants when I don't really see. I mean, you have to look at what the individual does in their role in the public sector to, deserve, to determine whether they are a public servant or not. If, if it appears that they are doing it for their own benefit, for the, to advance their own agenda, you can't call them a public servant. They are a, they are a parasite. Well, versus, we would have to disqualify the Clintons right off the bat. Right. We the people, getting to your Article 5, Paul, 
We the people, and you can read this down because my, yeah, my voice. So this, is, so this is the Article 5. We talked about this last week, and this is really the, the opportunity as a society, the United States as a society, can opt to have a convention of the state so that we can determine what, if any, changes need to be made to the Constitution to more adequately represent the, the needs of the people, right? So let me just read the, um, the Article 5. It, it's a very short... Um, uh, it's K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, so yeah. Article 5 of this is of the Constitution. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three quarters of the several states, or by the conventions in three-fourths thereof as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth classes in the ninth section of the first article, in that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. That was That's the, a lot of blah, 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 but I think the big... The bottom be line is this. There are two, two, two people can initiate it. A, 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 Congress. Congress and, and the states. Right. And, and you need two-thirds of both bodies or either, it, either to or, yeah. start the ball rolling, talk about it, make proposals, and then if it's agreed upon... That goes back to the states for a three-quarters vote. Right. And, it? and without that, nothing happens. So, Section 3 of the original Constitution, put that up, Pedro, says that the Senate of the United States should be composed of two senators from each state chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Now, uh, Simple to the point. Now that, so, so the, That's ori the, original. the original Constitution says then, that we do not elect our senators. They are appointed by the legislature. Well, voted on by the legislature, not appointed. In well, other words, somebody would be nominated and then it would be voted by, by, the, the, body. by, the, by the For body. For example, the Lynn City Council would turn around, call that the legislative body, and decide which one or who they're going to send to the state house right. as a state so, senator. So, so, and so, Tommy McGee would have been elected by the Lynn City Council as opposed to elected by the, by the people. Right. And... So then it, so that was the way it was, how it was originally constituted, and that was because the states needed to have a say, right? So the Senate was the, the state's ability to have a say in the federal government, right? To and protect the, the minority states, the small states, from being overwhelmed by the large states, right. population-wise. Right, right. Yeah. And then, so then they changed it, and they came up with Article 17. Right, and so popular election of senators. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branches of the state legislature. And that was basically it. So it was changed to a popular vote. Now you contend you'd like it to go back the other way. So, so here's, here's the thing that really bugs me about this, and I use the Scott Brown analysis, and, and you pointed out also that it's the Elizabeth Warren analysis as well. So let's just go back to 2010, after Senator Kennedy died and the, and the seat opened up. There was, a, there was an, an election for um, his open seat, in the, and that was uh, Martha Coakley it was a Democrat, Scott Brown was a Republican. And so you would think... That if the if the people of the state of Massachusetts had to decide who they were going to vote for, that would be a good thing, right? The problem was we got between they, they said that Brown alone got nine or ten million dollars in the last week leading up to the election, thrown in from outside of the state of Massachusetts to help him win the election. And the same thing was happening with Martha Coakley. She was getting all kinds of money from outside the state. So what does that tell you? It means that the, that it's not in the hands of the voters. It's in the hands of the big money people who are throwing money into the states. So I argue, and you said the same thing happened to Elizabeth Warren when she ran against Scott Brown the next time, right? And I agree with that. The fact of the matter is that even though the state of Massachusetts, the, the voters in the state of Massachusetts essentially decide who, who the senator will be, 
It's so much out of our control that it's not even funny because the big money. What about decided. the presidency, Paul? Why don't you go to the one step higher? Is the presidency bought, bought and sold? Is it? I mean, George Soros is being vilified in Hungary, his native country, and in Europe for trying to change an open border and open societies. He does it in this country. Yeah. So George Soros is determining. What about all of these protests? What are they doing? Well, well, so know, are, is there, are there real elections taking place, or is it all power? It's all power. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing is the reason why Donald Trump a, got elected, and B, is being so vilified is because he was really elected by the people for a change. There was actually— Not according the, to Hillary Clinton. The people decided it wasn't, it wasn't the media who was slanting the polls. Yeah. It wasn't George Soros. It wasn't Bill Koch. It wasn't any of these guys. They were basically—you know, this was basically— um, you know, an election that he won by appealing to the people, and the people came out to support him. That's it. But and she would argue, or they would argue, the left, that he lost the popular vote. Now, that's not what the election was about. Though. I understand that, but if, you know, people have never analyzed what was the popular vote, and because a lot of the popular vote were people who shouldn't have been voting in the first place. That's one piece of it. And another piece of it is, you know, if, if, if you win by one vote in a state, you carry the whole state. You carry the whole state. That's electorally. If you, if you win by three million votes, you carry the whole state. That's right. So, so it's irrelevant. So, so the fact that you've got three million more votes in California really doesn't matter. That's because the they don't do proportionality, which I happen to agree with. I do, too. I think that, you know, that protects the states from the being ones. overrun. That protects against the tyranny of the majority. The greatest fear that our founding fathers had was the the majority would overrule the minority. That's right. why we have the Bill of Rights. Now, we have people today, particularly in academia, who want to get rid of those safeguards. They want a, you know, you know what the irony the of life is? The irony of life is, is those folks that scream and yell about fascism are fascists. That's right. Because Antifa. they want control of everybody. Right. They want to get rid of any dissenting view. Right. So, so can we bring this back to the Senate? Yeah, go ahead. Well, so... Well, everything that we were saying, I think, makes a, 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 a world of sense and needs to be considered as well in terms of a constitutional convention of the states sure. where we would address certain issues. I think the states should argue to get their right to vote who their senators are going to be, not allow it to be a, quote, popular vote that was essentially... And by the way, mm -hmm. as a historian, I'd like to get your view on this. What was the conventional wisdom at the time of the 17th Amendment to, to have that changed? What was the... What was the that was, who was pushing it, and what was the wisdom? That was post-Civil post, post uh, Civil War, obviously, right? Yeah, 14, 13, 13, 13, 14, and 15th Amendment came out of the Civil War. Right. And we could argue they were unconstitutional. Right. And the reason why they were unconstitutional because three quarters of the states did not ratify it. Right, because they they excluded they were in everybody. From, they, right, so they, they were, were in rebellion, they were excluded so. from voting. So it was the, the those three amendments were imposed by the will of Abraham Lincoln in by the conquest. Right, right. right. So I would suggest that probably the same is true of the seventeenth that they wanted to make sure that the uh, people in the South, and Dixocrats, wouldn't be appointing. Folks that were sympathetic toward the... So as part of the debate on whether or not this makes sense to go back to the old way would be to understand the wisdom behind doing it in the first place. Because a state like Alabama would always have two Republican senators. Right. A but state so like Massachusetts to... would always have two Democratic senators. Right. Okay. At least now, there's a split. So, so, you, so where do you stand on this? Uh, the genie is out of the bottle. Leave it alone? It's out of the bottle. There's no way around it anymore. Once well, the genie's out, you're not going to put it back in. They, they, repeal, they repealed the... the um, That's prohibition. Prohibition. Yeah. Didn't work. But These neither folks, did this. Yeah. I, but, I would argue that this doesn't work because the decision-making of the electorate of a state is undermined when money comes from outside of the state. So we'll take that with the convention because we've only got a few minutes left to get okay. the comments. We'll start with this one here. Just finished the latest show. Word on the street is that we are about to lose access to the Ipswich River. Big loss for Lynn. Is that true? I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard it, so we have to uh, pass on that 
We got three minutes. Uh, let's see. What I wait may replace. So can I just say we, we we're going to look into that because if that if that that's right, we're going to. We have a um, I think we have a, a hundred year kind of lease with them, so I'm not sure that that can happen. But I, I'd be curious to find out what that is. Maybe what we should do is go up and. Uh, maybe we can all go up and visit the water and sewer when they have their board meeting. It's a public meeting, and we're all, everybody's welcome to attend. And if well, our water supply is in question, I think we should go. Possibly. Water may replace the school budget as the topic, whatever that means. That's the second one. Now, here's the key one, and we don't have much time. And uh, Let me read it quickly. It says, Obama in eight years made 278 uh, executive orders. Uh, in less than a year, Trump made 50 and is on course to have an average of 67 a year at the rate he is going. He signed more uh, in his first 100 days than any other prior president. This is the same man who claimed several times that the past, that Obama was essentially weak and ineffective as he had to sign that many and break the rules. Now, first of all, understand that Obama had an overwhelming majority and when he took office, both right. in the Senate, and yet he had to pull teeth to win by one vote in the House of Representatives and one vote in the Senate for Obamacare. Right. Right? Okay. That's number one. Number two, Trump was correct. He was ruling by edict. But Trump has got a different situation. He's got his own party, like McCain and Collins, fighting against him. So he said, what the heck? I've been trying to do it the right way, so I'll use the same tools that Obama did to undo Obama. And, and, I, and I would say that the undoing is, you know, so if, so if somebody passes a, a rule by fiat, yeah. and then he says, you know, and, and it's flimsy in its construction because it wasn't supported by the vote of Congress, and you just pull the thread and it just falls apart, and that's really all he's doing. So he's I realize so that. In, but in many cases, those, those um, executive orders are to reverse executive orders, right? That's right. Basically, well, he used the same tool. That's a funny thing. But, well, we don't have time to finish this one off, so let me put it this way. All is well if one thinks about all is well. But all is not well if you don't think it's well. Whatever that means, I have no idea. Until next week, we'll figure out what it means. Have a great one.